San Carlos, the city of good living. Like many cities, we have a slogan. However, unlike other cities, it takes only a few minutes to realize that in San Carlos, it's more than just a slogan. Friendly people, trees everywhere, beautiful hills, quiet neighborhoods, and friendly small businesses reflect the best of past, present, and future. Although major growth of the city came after World War II, the roots of its history reach into the past events that shaped the destiny of California and are closely intertwined with the development of the San Francisco Peninsula. Let's take a look back through the years of San Carlos. Although San Carlos lies some distance from either the Mission Dolores in San Francisco or the Mission at Santa Clara, the local inhabitants were undoubtedly affected by mission life, which brought increased travel by padres and laypeople and the presence of soldiers. Eventually, lands were granted by the Spanish government to deserving individuals. The 35,000-plus acre Rancho de las Pulgas, shown here on this map, at one time stretched from San Francisco Creek near Palo Alto to San Mateo Creek, and from the Bay Marshes to what is now known as Cañada Road. It was granted in 1795 to Captain Don Dario Arguello, Comandante of the Presidio in San Francisco and later Ninth Governor of California. His son, Don Luis, was the first native-born governor to serve under Mexican rule. After Don Luis's death in 1839, his widow, Doña Maria Soledad Ortega y Arguello, had an adobe home believed to be located at the corner of the present Magnolia and Cedar Streets. She occupied it from 1839 to 1854. Captain Alfred Robinson, on one of his journeys down the peninsula before 1840, described his visit to the rancho. El Rancho de las Pulgas was the next place of any importance in our route and is situated a little retired from the road at the foot of a small rising ground. It is the property of Doña Soledad Ortega, widow of Don Luis Arguello. I found her a beautiful woman and mother of three or four children. She was very ladylike in manner and treated us with the utmost courtesy. After dinner, we bade her adieu and proceeded on our way. Following the 1846 Bear Flag Revolt, the Gold Rush of 1849, and statehood in 1850, slowly but surely, the American influence began to be felt in San Carlos. In 1854, Timothy Guy Phelps, a San Francisco mercantile owner, began his land holding with 200 acres of the Arguello Rancho, including the Arguello Adobe, where he lived until his board and batten house was built next to it. He eventually increased his holdings to 3,500 acres of rancho lands, raising cattle which were shipped to San Francisco by barge. Phelps, who later built a stately mansion near what is now Holly Street and Old County Road, became a U.S. congressman in the 1860s and was an early regent of the University of California at Berkeley. He was also appointed collector of customs in San Francisco. Julius Johnson, a Phelps employee, planted the eucalyptus trees along what is now San Carlos Avenue near Cordilleras. Still later, John Britton, a hardware dealer in San Francisco, bought 3,000 acres extending from Cordilleras Creek near Redwood City to Pulgas Creek between Arroyo Avenue and Olive and west to Kenyatta Road. He built his home and carriage house at St. Francis and Elm, probably the site of El Sereno Court. Three children inherited the estate, William, the White Oaks area, Mary, the Oak Park area, west of Alameda de las Pulgas, in the hill behind Graceland Avenue, and Nathaniel, the area between Pulgas Creek and Britton Avenue, and an area known as San Carlos Manor, which became the family homestead. Near the family homestead stood Britton's Mill. This area is now the intersection of San Carlos Avenue, Carmelita Drive, and Phelps Road. In the 1890s, Nathaniel was president of the prestigious Bohemian Club of San Francisco and offered a site on his San Carlos property for a country jinx clubhouse and Bohemian Club retreat. A cornerstone was laid on Druids Hill near the present intersection of Orange and Elizabeth Streets. Unfortunately, the clubhouse was never constructed and eventually the cornerstone was moved to the present club retreat near the Russian River. Britain also had a huge hunting lodge built on the present Dale Avenue 
near to his elaborate home so as not to disturb Mrs. Britton when he entertained his cronies. When the railroad between San Francisco and San Jose was being laid in 1864, Nathaniel Britton granted the right-of-way through his property with the stipulation that a station agent and telegraph office be maintained at all times. In 1888, brownstone was brought from the Almaden quarries and stone masons from the British Isles, who were employed by Leland Stamford to construct his university, were sent to San Carlos to erect the station of Romanesque revival architecture on the right-of-way granted to the railroad by Britain. The original building exists today, except for the portico for the carriage trade. In 1976, the station was placed on the State Historical Landmark list. Guy and Asa Hull were two of four children of William Hull, a brickmaker who came to San Carlos in the 1880s to look for better clay. His brick home, near what is now Hull Drive and Laurel Street, was built from the clay made in the several brick kilns he constructed on the 40 acres he purchased from Phelps. Clay bricks from Hull San Carlos kilns were used in many important buildings of the day, such as Fort Mason, the Palace Hotel, and San Quentin Prison. In addition to clay bricks, the Hull family started a dairy farm. Milk was sold locally for five cents a quart if you brought your own container, and milk was also shipped by railroad to San Francisco. Near the whole property was Spring Valley Water Company. This company ultimately became part of the San Francisco Water Department. With the coming of the railroad, three attempts were made to develop a town. First, in 1888, the San Carlos Land Company tried to subdivide and sell lots on the lands once owned by Timothy Guy Phelps. In 1907, the San Carlos Park Syndicate was organized. The secretary, William Woosley, planned to make San Carlos a second Hillsborough using an elaborate sales campaign with flowering urns around the depot and along the streets. Mr. Woosley even acquired a replica of the beautiful Ohio State Building from the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1916 and floated it to San Carlos by barge. His dream of using it as a clubhouse never materialized, and the neglected building, which stood at the foot of Holly Street near the bay until the 1950s, eventually burned down. Woosley built his home near Elm and San Carlos Avenue. This location became the site of the first two-room school and later City Hall. Arriving in 1919, Fred Drake of the Mercantile Trust built his home on San Carlos Avenue near Cordilleras. Drake was more successful in developing San Carlos. To improve the water supply, he completed the underground reservoir, begun by Woosley and still in use today, on a hill near Northam Avenue and had water piped to the lots. Gas and electricity were installed and the streets paved. His desire to maintain the town's Spanish heritage is best illustrated by the Drake Building on the corner of San Carlos Avenue and El Camino and other commercial buildings on Laurel Street and the Spanish-style cottages along the tree-named streets of the town. Several of the early homes built in San Carlos can still be seen. Among them are the N.T. Smith House at 530 Walnut Street. Built in the late 1880s for Captain Nicholas T. Smith, a director of the San Carlos Land Company and secretary treasurer of the railroad, this house was first located on the northwest corner of Laurel and San Carlos Avenue. In 1927, it was moved to Walnut Street to make way for commercial development. In 1984, it suffered extensive fire damage. It has been reconstructed, although not to its original appearance. Britton Manor House at 40 Pine Avenue was built in 1881 for Nathaniel Britton, constructed of wood, stucco, and shingles, with richly carved window pediments, brackets, and finials, and imported friend roof tiles. The gardens were lovely with flowers, marble statues, and rare trees. The house even included a pit to house the bear which he acquired on one of his trips to Alaska. While N.T. Smith had built his downtown home near the railroad, he decided a country retreat would be nice. So in 1889, a cottage, complete with carriage house, was built near the corner of Magnolia and Chestnut. Mrs. Smith is said to have designed the roof to look like a deck of cards about to be shuffled. George Washington Phelps, no relation to Timothy Guy Phelps, 
built his home on Walnut Street around 1890. It was later purchased by County Assessor Clarence Hayward in 1902. Sold in 1910 to the San Carlos Park Syndicate, it was owned by Virginia Classen, daughter of former city engineer Robert Classen, who in the 1920s built the Hacienda Garden Apartments around the original Phelps home. The Cooper House on Holly Street was constructed by Mr. Krieger, a well-known builder for the wealthy widow, Mrs. Margaret Cooper. The home, seen here, is in the background. In the foreground of this picture is Mr. Krieger on the left and Merritt Hosmer, who as an adult served as a city councilman and school board trustee. The wagon is from the Emmett Grocery Store in Belmont. The Callenborn home at 657 Knoll, while not one of the earliest homes, was built in 1942 by A.S. Callenborn. Callenborn bought the lot in 1935 because he had courted his wife, Miss Emma Hayward, by taking her on picnics to the area then known as Pole Hill, also called Druids Hill. He leveled the lot and formed the 13,000 adobe bricks used in its construction from the clay. Along with the housing development, a few businesses were begun in town. In 1916, a hangar and Cooley flying field were built between San Carlos Avenue and Britton Avenue, east of the railroad. Today, the airport is further east near the bay. In 1926, the San Carlos Feed and Fuel was established. The tower still stands east of the tracks near Branston Road. The mile-long San Francisco Speedway was built in 1921, east of the railroad between what is now Branston Road and Howard Avenue, using four million board feet of lumber. It was destroyed by a fire a year later on Easter Sunday, 1922. Other commercial establishments followed, clustering west of the depot in the first two blocks of Cypress Avenue, as San Carlos Avenue was then called, and spreading out along quiet Maple Street which was later to be renamed El Camino Real. The original El Camino Real is now Old County Road. In the first block, on the north side, the original stores were Murta's San Carlos Meat Market, the Windmill Restaurant, now the Patio Bar, Conklin's General Store and Restaurant, later became the location of Newell Sharkey's Gas Station, now the real estate office building on the northwest corner of San Carlos Avenue and El Camino. On the south side stood a beauty shop and butcher shop, where Vic's restaurant is now located, and across from the depot, south of San Carlos Avenue, was the popular Mrs. Tate's Tea Room, now the Carlos Club with its Art Deco sign. The second block included the Bank of America building, grocery store, and the Carlos Theater. This area now is the location of the Sam Trans and the Eureka building. James Hugh Martin served as the first elected mayor of San Carlos from 1927 to 1930. Martin owned a lumber yard that occupied the northeast edge of town across from the depot. With commercial and residential growth came the first school where 20 students met in a house. Before that, students traveled to Belmont or Redwood City. On the southwest corner of San Carlos Avenue and Elm, now City Hall Park, a two-room, Eight grade school was built in 1918. The school became City Hall in 1930 when a new school was opened on Chestnut Street. This new school, named Central School, is still in use today, and in the auditorium built later is the location of the biennial Chicken's Ball, one of the most successful PTA-sponsored projects in the country. In 1969, the old two-room schoolhouse was torn down and a new, modern city hall was built. The city's first paid employee was Edward J. Wheeler. Wheeler served as the town police chief. Story has it that Wheeler patrolled the town on a bicycle equipped with an automobile steering wheel in place of the handlebars. When hot on patrol, he would keep an eye on the city hall, where a large electric light had been installed. When an emergency call came in, the telephone operator would flip the switch turning the light on. Upon seeing the light, Wheeler would ride on down to see what the trouble was. By the 1930s, the police department had grown to four policemen and two police cars. In 1923, a volunteer fire department was formed using a fire truck composed of a 1916 taxicab chassis with a chemical truck body donated by the San Francisco Fire Department. Ed Wheeler, shown here on horseback with Mayor William Hull, 
was a teamster working in San Francisco, served as the volunteer fire chief until 1944. At that time, the city hired its first paid fireman and Lyle Clark took over as chief. So successful were the fundraising card parties and dinners given by the volunteers and their wives that a firehouse was erected the same year. Soon thereafter, the department purchased its new fire truck, a 1927 Seagrave. This truck was still in service as late as 1969 when it was retired and painstakingly restored and now can be seen at the Museum of San Carlos. During the 1930s, a drill tower was constructed next to the firehouse. In 1940, a larger three-bay, two-story, complete with brass fire pole, was erected. This firehouse was again replaced in 1992 and is in use today by South County Fire Department. The original firehouse was completely reconstructed in the late 1970s, a community service project of the San Carlos Lions Club and local firemen, and now houses the Museum of San Carlos at 533 Laurel Street. The museum is open from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month, and private tours can be scheduled by calling 802 4354. Docents and displays are supported by the long-term efforts of the San Carlos villagers. Many social events of the 1920s and 30s were held at the Devonshire Club, located at the top of Club Drive. It went to war during World War II as the service club for the Dog Training Center, which was established on the old H&H Ranch just next to the club. After the war, the club opened as a restaurant and bar, and in 1952, a spectacular fire that could be seen in the Oakland Hills across the bay burned the club to the ground. Along with other community developments, land for a city park was purchased in 1936. In 1938, the WPA, Works Project Administration, constructed the amphitheater and adobe brick building. Only one of the adobe buildings currently remains standing near the youth center. The park was dedicated in 1960 to honor Edward Burton Sr., a councilman for 18 years and mayor for four. From the 1960s, San Carlos shared the movement of families to suburban communities like other peninsula cities. San Carlos offered affordable housing, safe neighborhoods, good schools, family-oriented activities, and good weather. Many of the people interviewed for San Carlos Stories in 1999 referred often to these same positive attributes of San Carlos. John Buchanan, a former city council member, settled in San Carlos in 1973. Cliff Bechtel grew up in San Carlos and remained there through the late 1990s to raise his own family despite high housing prices. David Buckmaster recalled San Carlos as an ideal place to grow up in the 1970s and 80s. Gordy Burton, grandson of Pops Burton, has chosen to remain in San Carlos and hopes that the blueprint of community involvement learned in San Carlos will stay with the next generation of San Carlos children, wherever they settle. In the early days, there were weekend drawings for giveaway lots at the San Carlos Theater. Today, San Carlos has grown and now experiences relatively few empty lots, expensive homes, and huge remodels replacing original structures. Homes that once had one car now have three or four. Homes that were 900 square feet have been tripled or more in size. Homes that had one phone line now have two or three, and the internet is the most common media for communications. New housing developments have been erected at Crestview. Highlands formed the site of the San Carlos High School, which was torn down in the early 1980s, and Upper Devonshire. We see mixed commercial with residential living and elegant living in the more recently rebuilt Pacific Hacienda condominiums, which opened in 2003, replacing the historic Hacienda garden apartments built in the 20s. Several older structures continue to remind us of the influence of Spanish architecture throughout our city near the downtown, along Elm Street and other locations around town. The physical changes to San Carlos also have been dramatic. While once Laurel Street had 15% vacancies and aged storefronts, we now see a beautiful streetscape and many facades have been upgraded. The train tracks have been raised, beautifying El Camino and Old County Road while eliminating our most dangerous and frustrating traffic problems. The industrial area largely has been redeveloped. Most city parks have been refurbished. The city also has added one large new park and two neighborhood parks. The commercial segment of the city also experienced much change in the later stage of the 20th century. 
San Carlos is recognized by many as being the Bethlehem of Silicon Valley, Varian, including IMAC, Lincurt, Linton, Ampex, and Delma Victor were all here. However, several of these electronic manufacturing companies moved or closed their doors in the 1970s and 80s. The Delma Victor building became uh, Walgreens. Ampex was now at Laurel and Howard, and the Lincurt site became the Home Depot Albertson site. Even the older Varian IMAC CPC site near 101 is currently proposed as a new site for Palo Alto Medical with a targeted opening of 2008. Other companies like the Circle Star Theater, home to several top name entertainers like Sammy Davis and Frank Sinatra, became Mozart Development, while the Hobby Shop, Dollhouse, Black Mountain Water, and Paul Joe's Restaurant transferred to new tenants. Even the old sewage plant on the east side of 101 later became the sites of Hiller Aviation Museum, a hotel and two restaurants. The Chamber of Commerce located at the south end of Laurel Street has grown to a membership of more than 700 and provides support and networking to most businesses in San Carlos and hosts the annual Art and Wine Fair in October. San Carlos has seen tremendous changes in the last 30 years. While the population has not changed much, the lifestyle has changed in almost every way. 95% of our children finishing high school go on to higher education. The new jobs in our community tend to be of two types, high-tech or service. The high-tech jobs pay very well, creating the market for restaurants and retail that leads to the service jobs. And the city staff has changed to meet the needs of a more sophisticated citizenry. While not adding that many more employees, San Carlos has broadened staff in order to professionalize police, fire, public works, and parks and recreation services, as well as automating city operations. In the past few years, the city has received three statewide, two national, and two international awards of excellence. San Carlos was the first city in the world to create its own homepage, the first city in the world to outlaw fireworks, and the first city to require smoke detectors in new homes. New San Carlos buildings and improvements have been added. A new senior citizen in the 70s and most recently and with local community financial support, a youth center at Burton Park and the new library were constructed. The city continues to improve infrastructure at the turn of the century on roads, communication fiber optics, downtown beautification and parks. Current real estate listings include the wording prestigious schools for good reason. The five elementary schools, including one of which is the state's longest operating charter school in the nation, are highly ranked compared to the national and state standards. PTA support, parent volunteers, educational foundation, annual fundraisers, and support to a local bond issue, $23 million in 1997, and the parcel tax, Measure D, in 2003, support our hardworking teachers and administrators. While the sound of carpenter hammers could be heard constantly in the 1950s and 60s with the construction of several new schools, these same structures received some of their needed refurbishment and additions 40 years later. San Carlos students continue to be separated after middle school with movements to our adjacent Caramont and Sequoia high schools, new charter, high school, or private institutions on the peninsula. Sports have always been an important part of family and school in San Carlos. Almost 2,000 boys and girls play soccer in the fall. In fact, San Carlos has one of the highest percentages of girls playing soccer in the state. Baseball is another major draw for children, coaches, and parents. Many of us remember our national championship Babe Ruth Little League team of the 1961s. Today, the increased demand of the use of fields has created a debate for synthetic grass in 2004. Community spirit was cited often by San Carlos residents who had been here for many years and it appears to continue to draw people to this city. These close connections individuals make one another our mostly through voluntary associations, churches and little leagues and soccer teams, garden clubs, civic commissions, PTAs, etc. Our communities struggle with the decline of community involvement due to the change in family structure and the role of women, work commitments, and commuting, and the mere fact that everyone is just too busy to get involved. San Carlos, however, continues to thrive on community involvement. It appears that many San Carlos residents have found a strong network of friends, local associations, and civic connectedness in the community. This blueprint was laid down long ago by an earlier generation of San Carlins in such activities as the long-running and quirky Chicken's Ball, Hometown Days, Sport Leagues, 4-H Scouting, Active PTAs, a local garden club, and well-attended churches. 
While the early 2000s see some decline in membership of such organizations, the tradition has continued in more years recently with the establishments of a youth tutoring program, Healthy Cities, summer concerts in the Burton Park, Week of the Family, and in summer of 2004, a Thursday evening farmer's market on Laurel Street. From a population in the 1890s of about 50 people, San Carlos grew to about 800 individuals when it was incorporated in 1925. The census of 1940 recorded 2,500 people. Today, San Carlos' population remains constant at 28,000. Other changes can be viewed with the following graphs. With all of these changes, you could wonder if a visitor from the past would recognize our little community. And the answer would be yes. The core values of the San Carlos community remains the same. A commitment to our neighbors, a willingness to volunteer, and an overriding sense of community. Fred Drake, the father of San Carlos, called this place the city of human friendliness. He could feel at home here today. Thanks for taking a tour today of San Carlos. Please tell your friends about our Museum of San Carlos and get your copy of the city's two written books on San Carlos history. Through the Years in San Carlos by Effie Mahaney, published in 1967, and San Carlos Stories by Linda Garvey, published in 2000.